Good morning. We want to welcome you to Fremont Alliance Church. As we stand this morning, let's lift our voices in praise with one of my favorite hymns by Charles Wesley, O for a Thousand Tongues, to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Let's sing together.
Good morning, Fremont Alliance. My name is Brandon. I'm the youth pastor here. Just want to go through a few announcements with you guys. If you're a visitor with us this morning, welcome. So glad you're here. For those online, welcome. Uh, just want to give you a way that you can get connected, uh, get to know us a bit better. So if, if you, uh, I would invite you to text uh, FAC visitor to 94000. So after texting that number, if you're a visitor, uh, you'll get a message with more information about who we are, uh, what we do, and get you connected. You also uh, have an opportunity to receive a small gift from us by texting that number. I'd highly encourage you to do that. Uh, secondly, we want to give you a update on our children and student ministries as we head into the fall due to COVID and all that's going on. Our teams are getting creative, working very hard to safely resume our children's uh, ministry and our student ministry. Uh, the plan for us is to resume on fall kickoff at the end of August, so stay tuned for more details on how we're doing that and what that looks like. Additionally, uh, this week we sent out an email uh, with a survey just getting uh, your thoughts on on how we should resume that, if you're coming back or not, those sorts of things. So uh, I'd highly encourage you, if you didn't get that email, contact our church office uh, if, in order to get that, and uh, we can get your information and, and know how to proceed from there. Uh, July 29th is this Wednesday. Uh, it's a 180 Lake Day. So 615 to 8, uh, 7th through 12th graders will be out at Fremont State Lakes, number 10, uh, having a great time, food, games, tubing. It's going to be a blast. So if, if you haven't been out to any student ministry events this summer, I highly encourage you to come out this Wednesday. It's going to be awesome. Uh, that's for 7th through 12th graders. And then finally, we have teams of volunteers that prepare meals uh, two Fridays a month for LifeHouse, which is a local shelter that serves homeless and uh, low-income families. Uh, so if you'd like to volunteer in that ministry, um, you'll serve once every other month or six times a year. Uh, and currently, we're in need of a group of volunteers for the second Friday uh, of every other month. Uh, in order to make meals and serve them to those families. Uh, so if you're interested in that and serving in that way, uh, contact the church office for those details. Uh, let me pray as we transition back into worship. Uh, Lord Jesus, uh, we're so grateful uh, for you. Uh, thank you for your death and resurrection uh, that gives us hope, um, eternal hope. Uh, I pray that we can continue to focus our hearts and our minds on you this morning as we uh, continue to worship. In your name, amen. Stand as we continue to worship this morning.
did not seek you, but you sought us. Lord, in the midst of us turning our backs on you and pursuing sin and pursuing our own desires, Lord, you chose to come after us and to seek us out, to draw us to yourself, and to show us your grace and your love. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. And Lord, we know that because you thought, sought us out, because you care for us and love for us, we know, Lord, that even in these uncertain times that we live in right now, Lord, that you are always there for us, that you love us just as much now as you did before. And Lord, I pray that as we go through these difficult times, Lord, that we continue to, to lean on you, to trust in you, knowing that you'll bring us through as you've brought through our brothers and sisters in many trials and tribulations, not only in this country, but throughout the world. And Lord, we just thank you that we can lean on you, that we can trust in you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
this morning and look into the book of Galatians, I pray, Lord, that you would challenge each and every one of us in the midst of our growth in faith, that we would stay true to the gospel, that we would not add to it nor take away from it. And Lord, that as we share the gospel with others, that we would not add to it, add additional burdens onto them, but Lord, we would keep your gospel simple in the way that you had intended it. Simple that a child could understand, but yet at the same time, so mysterious and so complicated that we can spend eternity pondering everything that you've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Worship team, thank you. Good morning. Well, we are continuing our, uh, our study in the book of Galatians, so if you would, grab your Bibles, turn to uh, Galatians chapter 2. I came across, this, uh, came across this biography of an individual that you may be familiar with, an individual that, that you may have heard of before. I'll read you just a little bit of what I, what I read this week. It says, uh, this individual, uh, born to a wealthy family in 1908, he was an undisciplined student and often clashed with his teachers, even when earning high marks for his schoolwork. After applying for a job with the foreign, with the foreign office and failing the entrance, entrance exam, his family connections landed him a job with the Reuters News Agency. After that, he tried his hand at banking and stockbroking with unsatisfactory results. It wasn't until World War II broke out that he found his true calling. Although he never saw combat... He held a series of important desk jobs and was part of a team which traveled to the United States to meet with Colonel Wild Bill Donovan and helped write the blueprint for the new Office of the Coordinator of Information, which of course was the organization which preceded the creation of the CIA. This individual found that he had a love for espionage and told his friends that he'd always wanted to write a spy novel. Working at a feverish pace and drawing upon his World War II experiences, he completed his first book. For his main character, who served as the author's alter ego, he later said he wanted to choose a name which was as boring and nondescript as possible. Looking around his library, he came across a reference book entitled Birds of the West Indies, written by an ornithologist. Does anyone know what that ornithologist's name is? Anyone? The author's name was James Bond. So yeah, this individual is uh, Ian Fleming, maybe a name that you're familiar with, the creator of the James Bond um, series of, of books and movies, and that's really where it all started. And I think what Ian Fleming was able to do is he was able to tap into people's love for a good spy story. And it goes on, it says that since then the James Bond franchise has become the longest continually running series in film history. There's been a total of 27 films associated with the character. Taken together, they've grossed a staggering amount of money, over $7 billion in revenue. James Bond films. And so Ian Fleming realized, I think, that everybody, like I mentioned earlier, everybody loves a good spy story. That is, everyone, apparently, with the exception of Paul. Uh, Paul... In, in uh, Galatians 2, when we get there, we're going to look, and Paul says that false teachers had infiltrated the church and were spying on them. That they were spying on them to see what kind of uh, freedoms they had been experiencing in Jesus. So to recap, really just the last couple of weeks, Paul goes on to, Paul begins his letter by defending the gospel. He's clear that the gospel message was not a product of any man uh, no one made it up. Um, it wasn't, it w- wasn't a product of anyone, but it, it came from God himself, that it was God's message that Paul was called to take to the Gentiles. So not only does he need to defend the gospel, Paul's got to defend himself. And the way that he does that is by sharing his own testimony and, and talking about how it wasn't, um, it wasn't from the, uh, the 12 that I received the message Um, I share this gospel with authority because I received it directly from the risen Jesus Christ. So I received it directly from him, and so I can speak with authority on the issue of the gospel. It wasn't as if God gave the gospel to me, and then I sort of filtered it through the apostles to get confirmation of that gospel, and then took it to the Gentiles, or it wasn't 
God gave the gospel message to the apostles, and then they taught it to me, and then I took it to the Gentiles. It wasn't that way. I got it directly from the risen Jesus Christ, and I took his message to the, to the Gentiles, and that's how it went. But the problem that Paul was running into was that Paul would go to, go to a city, he'd go to a, a nation that, that had never heard the message of Jesus before, and he would preach the gospel and plant churches and raise up leaders and, and build up the church. And then when he had kind of gotten to that stage, he'd move on to another city. And when he would move on to another city, what would happen is those Judaizers, which we talked about last week, would come into that city that he had just left and then drive a wedge between Paul and the church. And saying things like, well, Paul may have started out with the right message, but he really he got it wrong at some point along the way. Or um, Paul was just taught the message by other people and and it got lost in translation, like the old, you know, telephone game. I mean, they're saying Paul was way down the line on that telephone game. He got it, he got it wrong. Um, he, didn't, he didn't quite hear the message right. Or, frankly, it doesn't matter anyway. You could say, Paul, he wasn't, he wasn't a real apostle anyway, so there's no reason to even listen to him in the first place. And so they were driving a wedge between Paul and the church and his message. So Paul really kind of has to walk up. He has to walk sort of an interesting line here because Paul has to, in some ways, um, claim independence from the, from, the, from the 12 apostles, right? He's got to say, I didn't get my message from them. I wasn't taught it by them. They didn't have anything to do with the message that God gave me to bring to the Gentiles, right? So he's got to establish some kind of independence from them while at the same time saying, I need some sense of unity from them. There needs to be a relationship. There needs to be a fellowship between us as we all go and, and share this, this, this new gospel message. Um, and so there just was this concern that the Judaizers were, were messing up the gospel that they had, been, they had been trying to preach. So in order for Paul to do that, in order for Paul to establish that, he's going to begin this, this chapter by sharing with the apostles really a gospel testimony. Um, he's going he's gonna to deal with the gospel that's under fire, and then he's also going to tell of his partnership in the gospel. So let's start verse 1. It says, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running or had not been running my race in vain. So Paul begins chapter 2 by really continuing sort of his timeline of ministry that he ended chapter 1 with. If you go back, um, the second half of verse 16 in chapter 1, right after he, he, he comes into interaction with, with, um, with Jesus and puts his faith in Jesus, says, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to, Dam to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stay with him 15 days. Down to verse 21. It says, then I went to Syria and, and Cilicia. And then in, in chapter 2, then he says, then after 14 years. So you get, Paul's moving fairly quickly through that timeline, but you get a sense of really in the, at least the first 17 years of his ministry, how little time he actually spent with the apostles. I mean, he lists about two weeks here spending time with Peter in that, in that entire time. And so, but Paul then records finally walking into Jerusalem to meet with these men. He walks into really headquarters, per se, of sort of that gospel message as it was spreading. Jerusalem would have been kind of like going back to headquarters to meet with, as verse 9 puts it, he's meeting with these pillars of the church. He's meeting with Peter, James, John, men like this, that, that were viewed as these, these were the, the founders. Of these, these guys were the ones that brought the, the initial message. These were pillars in the church. And his hope is that he can walk away knowing that he hadn't spent the last 14 years in vain. So the question is, what, what does he mean by that? What does he mean? My hope was that I hadn't wasted my time, that I hadn't spent the last 14 years in vain. Is Paul saying that he came to Jerusalem to present to them the gospel in hopes of finding out that he hadn't messed it up? Is that what Paul's hoping? That Paul comes to these men, presents them the gospel, and he's like, man, I hope I find out that I didn't get the gospel wrong. No, look back at, at chapter 1, verse 11. It says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that I preached is not of human origin. 
I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul knows the message because he received it directly from Jesus. He's confident of that message. He knows the gospel. He knows the power of the gospel to to change people's lives. He's not doubting that. But I think Paul is saying is that I'm running in vain if I don't have your support. If I'm out here on my missionary journeys preaching the gospel, if I'm doing it on my own, if I'm by myself in this gospel message, I'm running in vain. And so he's looking for that support. He's looking for that fellowship with these other men. He wants to know that, that, that the supposed partners he has in the gospel are preaching the same message as him because he knows that his ministry hangs on that truth. Do these men share the same message that I'm bringing to them? Because as the Judaizers are coming in and trying to tear down everything that they had preached, he's got to know that there are other people who are standing with him in that message and that he's not alone in that. So the primary way that Paul is going to accomplish this is by bringing people along with him as he meets with these men. I mean, who does it say that, that Paul brought, brought with him? He's, the first guy he says I brought with me was Barnabas. Barnabas is, a, uh, Barnabas is a safe choice for Paul to bring as he's meeting with these Jerusalem teachers, right? Barnabas was, he was a Jew and was well-known, was well-respected. Everyone thought very highly of Barnabas. Um, in the book of Acts, we're told that Barnabas is called the son of encouragement. Like, he just had, he had a great um, reputation, just well-respected. So for Paul to bring Barnabas with him, in a lot of ways, it was a confirmation of his ministry. It was a confirmation of his message. He gave um, credibility to Paul's message for Paul to be there standing alongside him, right? So Paul, Barnabas is the, is the safe choice there. That is not the case with Timothy, Timothy was a Gentile. Timothy was an uncircumcised Gentile. Timothy um, was, in a lot of ways, really an outsider, an outsider to that room. Timothy's a completely different story. Even though he's a Gentile, even though he's an uncircumcised Gentile, he's a brother in Christ. He's a man who likely came to faith under Paul's ministry and had, had been involved in ministry with Paul. They had a great relationship. Um, So when it comes to this gathering of church leaders, Titus is the outsider. If you could imagine for a second, somebody calls you up and says, hey, I got two tickets to the Husker game this weekend. Do you you want the tickets? Well, of course you want the tickets. Yes, I'll take the tickets, right? So you call up a a friend of yours and say, hey, I got an extra ticket to the Husker game this weekend. Do you want to come with me? And that person says, yes, I want to go. I'll go with you to the game. And so you got your plans for the weekend. Saturday morning, you wake up, you drive over to your friend's house pick him up and he walks out the door. Um, the Huskers are playing Iowa that weekend. He walks out the door and he's wearing nothing but black and gold. And so you're, <laughs> so you're thinking to yourself, oh, how do I get out of this, right? Uh, like all of a sudden I'm not feeling well. Like maybe I'm just sick and I can go home or, you know, whatever. But you decide, all right, he's my friend. I'm going to take him to the game. But you know the entire time you're there as you're surrounded by all other Husker fans that you're the one who brought this guy right? That you're the one who brought the Iowa fan into the middle of the Husker, you know, fan section or whatever that is, you know? Um, And so even though this doesn't have anything to do with sports, it has everything to do with the gospel. But in some ways, it's as if like, Paul, you brought an outsider. You brought an outsider in, into our, um, into our world. And so in a lot of ways, it's as if Titus, Titus for Paul it's as if Paul is saying, Titus is exhibit A for me. Titus is exhibit A of everything that I have been about since I have come to know Jesus. As God has sent me with the gospel to the Gentiles, here's a man who is a Gentile, he's uncircumcised, he has come to know Jesus, he has come to put his faith in Jesus Christ. This is what God is doing through our ministry. He is exhibit A of what God is doing. And so Titus, in a lot of ways, exists, or Titus is on the trip, really, to expose the lie of the Judaizers that Titus needed to not only put his faith in Jesus, but that Titus also had to conform to the law. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. 
That's, that's not the case here. This is a man who knows Jesus, who is walking with Jesus, has been in ministry alongside of me. All this man needs is Jesus and nothing else. He's exhibit A of what God has been trying to do. His life is a testimony against those who would put really the gospel under fire. You look at verse 4. He writes, This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. These Judaizers wanted to attach the work of the law back onto their message of grace. Their message of grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ. These men wanted to come back and hang on to that message, works of the law. Have you ever noticed, um, maybe you were in a conversation one time with, with your parents, or you're in a conversation with your husband or your wife, and you might have said something like, hey, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking maybe we should buy a new TV. And then all of a sudden, all your ads on social media are for televisions. You ever notice that? Like, it's as if, like, when the advertisers come to find out something about you, when they come to, come to find out what it is that you may be interested in or something that you may be interested in purchasing, now all of a sudden it shows up on all your websites, all your social media, it shows up on, on all your emails, and it's as if they, they've got their, their fingers all wound up in everything that you do, and you can't get rid of them. And the same way the Judaizers, when it came to the gospel, when it came to uh, the gospel being preached in these cities, the Judaizers would always come in after the fact and kind of get their fingers back into everything, um, their, their fingers of this works-based salvation, and it was choking out the life of the gospel. It was choking out the life of the church. And so it's kind of like that with, with the, the Judaizers. Turn ahead, if you would, just, um, just maybe even just a couple of pages in your Bible, Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes this, Galatians 5 verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare that every man who lets himself be circumcised that, excuse me, every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is ob obligated to obey the whole law. And so it's like, if you can imagine it as a, as a spectrum up here this morning, that Paul is standing over here on, on this end of the spectrum with a grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ's gospel. And then you've got the Judaizers here on the other side, that it is, it is faith and works combined, Right? that what he's saying is that this is not a, a gradual increase to this message. Instead, it, it's probably a much more accurate picture to say that Paul is standing on top of a pillar on this end of the spectrum. Meaning, if I take one inch, if I take one step off of this pillar, it's not like I have, I'm gradually moving more towards a workspace salvation. If I take one step off of this pillar, I am falling off the message that I came with completely off that message. So it's like, Paul, why do you, you know, why you got to be so difficult? Why do you got to be so rigid? You know, you got to be so dogmatic about everything, right? But Paul's saying, I can't afford to allow one piece of the law to be reattached to this gospel message, because if you attach one piece of the law, you have reattached the entire law. And now you are, again, slaves to the law. You are slaves to your works, I can't do it. And so I think we need to be able to think through the importance of that understanding. The reality is that, that our ability to think through our own faith in light of today's worldviews, in light of today's beliefs, not, you know, it's important to understand the context that Paul's coming from and the, the false teaching that Paul is dealing with, but the reality is, is that we deal with our own, our own false teachings, our own worldviews that aren't in line with God's worldview and that, that aren't biblical worldviews on, on so many topics. So if the idea of apologetics is new to you, if the idea of defending your faith is, is sort of a new idea or you know, you've not done that much reading or, or anything, I brought really a couple of things this morning. Um, the first one is if you're kind of new to that topic, like one of the classic books on this is A Case for Christ. If you've not read this, fantastic 
fantastic book. Um, will really help you think through some things that maybe you've never thought through before. Um, fantastic book. But I wrote, or I texted a friend of mine who has his degree in apologetics, and I, and I asked him the question, and I just said, um, hey, what would you recommend for somebody who maybe you've already, you've already um, done some apologetic stuff, you've done some reading, you've done some study on that, like what would be, what would be the next thing, right? Like what would be sort of that next level kind of reading if, if you're already sort of familiar with it? Um, the book that he suggested was uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, it's a book by uh, Norm Geisler, Frank Turek. And so I just brought those. Um, if for some reason you're interested after the service, feel free. You can come, come take a look at those. But like pretty much everything else on the planet, I'm pretty sure it's available on Amazon um, fairly, fairly cheaply. But, um, you know, we need to be able to, to wrestle with false messages and um, things just, just as Paul was dealing with, dealing with them in his, in his ministry context. So we mentioned uh, last week that the book of Galatians is likely Paul's first letter that he's written. I want to read, read for you a, a text that, that Paul wrote to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy, probably the last letter that Paul wrote. And so we're getting towards the end of Paul's life. We're getting towards the end of Paul's ministry. And what we see Paul doing is that Paul is starting to hand off ministry that, that he's been involved in to, to younger leaders. He's been, he's been handing them off. You read, um, we already talked about Titus, for instance. Titus is a perfect example of that. Um, Paul and Titus were in Crete, and Paul was about ready to leave Crete, but he tells Titus, Titus, I want you to stay. I want you to stay here. I want you to stay in leadership in the church. I want you to raise up leaders. I want you to help build the church, right? So he's, he's passing off ministry to these younger leaders. He's doing the same thing with Timothy. Here's what he says. It says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Or in other words, Timothy, as I leave here, this is what I want you to know. This is what I want you to be doing. He says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their eyes away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So as Paul is leaving ministry to Timothy, he's saying, preach the word. I want you to stand on this pillar. Don't give an inch. Don't take a step off that pillar. And by the way, don't be surprised when people don't just jump on that pillar with you. Don't be surprised when People who you thought were on that pillar with you start jumping off for other gospels, which aren't really gospels at all, and start preaching messages that are much, um, maybe much more, uh, well, how, how does he word it? It says, to say what their itching ears want to hear, maybe a gospel message that is much more centered on myself, right? God, God exists for me. Right? That God exists to prosper me. God exists for me to be successful and healthy or wealthy. You know what I'm saying? Just that life and God himself exists for me while instead of this message that I exist for him. And I'm going to stand on this pillar and I'm not going to give you an inch. Paul says, so that the gospel may be preserved for you. So that you wouldn't fall victim to these grace and works messages so that it would be preserved for you. So the last thing Paul records in this section is the partnership that he received in the gospel. Look at verse 6. It says, As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as, as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, and they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing that I had been eager to do all along. It's an interesting statement made here by Paul, I think. You got Peter, James, and John, guys that are considered pillars in the church. 
very influential, very powerful, very respected individuals. And Paul says, well, whoever you think they are or whatever they are makes no difference to me. <laughs> is, is he in some way like now being like disrespectful to these men? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think what Paul is trying to say is I am so much more interested in the message that I am in the messenger. So it doesn't matter if it's Peter. It doesn't matter if it's James. It doesn't matter if it's John, the one who's bringing you the gospel. It doesn't matter if it's little Billy down the street. You look at chapter 1, verse 8. I don't care if it was an angel that brought you the message. If it is not the gospel, I'm not interested. These pillars in the church... Do I have their partnership? Do I have unity with these men in terms of the message that they're sharing? And the conclusion that these men, these leaders in Jerusalem come to is, yes, Paul, the gospel we're hearing you preach, this is the same thing that we've been saying this whole time. We are in agreement. We are in fellowship. We are in unity in this gospel message. And we recognize, Paul, you've been called to the Gentiles. Peter, you've been called to the Jews. Very different, um, very different ministry contexts. Um, very unique callings in their lives. But even though their callings were unique, they recognized that it was one God who had directed their ministry. We recognize God has been at work at Peter and sending him to the Jews. God has been at work in Paul and sending him to the Gentiles. It was one gospel, one grace that was dr the driving force of their mission. One gospel that had empowered their unique callings. And so the apostles, it says, extend to him their right hand of fellowship. It was a sign of relationship. It was a sign of unity. It was a sign of fellowship between them together. But they did say this. So the 12 are saying, yes, Paul, we're in agreement. We recognize God's call on your life. We recognize that you carry with you the true gospel. We're, all, we're totally behind you and you taking the gospel to the Gentiles. But we want you to do one thing. Paul's like, you name it. You tell me what you want me to do. He says, we want you to remember the poor. This is an interesting request because I think in many ways what these leaders are asking is, is not simply just to remember the poor, but it's possible that these men are saying, Paul, we want you to remember us. Remember us. Because what was happening in Jerusalem, you had these feasts and festivals and things that were happening, for, for instance, like uh, Passover would have been a huge example that there would have been tens of thousands of Jews who had come to Jerusalem from all over the place. And you had guys like Peter, James, and John doing ministry in that city at that time. And, and people would have, would have been coming to Jerusalem and, and coming to faith in Jesus, hearing the gospel. And it's not as if there was a whole bunch of churches other places. So these people would come to Jerusalem, come to faith in Christ, and they would just stay there as out-of-towners, like permanent out-of-towners. And so they had no place to go and um, intense persecution of Christians in Jerusalem, uh, as we're going to read in, in just a second here. Uh, intense famine as a result, poverty, um, extreme poverty going on in, in Jerusalem. It was a very difficult time to be a Christian in Jerusalem. So I think these men are saying, Paul, as you go, as you take the gospel on your missionary journeys, don't forget us. Paul's saying it was the thing that I was... I was, I was very eager to do, he said. Now, if I could maybe change Paul's words here, if I could, I think not only is Paul saying it was the thing that I was eager to do, I think Paul just as easily could have said, it's the thing I was already doing. You're asking me to take care of the poor. That's what I have been doing this whole time. If you think about um, what is it that brought Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem in the first place? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't this meeting with these men, although this is a, what came of this was, was, was great. But, but what was the reason that they were in Jerusalem in the first place? And it's interesting to take the book of Galatians and then take the book of Acts and you lay them on top of one another and how Acts kind of just shines light on this timeline that Paul gives of what, what has happened um, in the church. And so I want to read for you, this is Acts chapter 11. We're told that Barnabas goes to Antioch, and Barnabas is, is sharing the gospel, and people are coming to faith in Christ, and the church is growing, and leaders are being raised, and, and Paul is just like, like, whoa, like this is too much. Like, I can't, I can't do all of this by myself. And so Paul, who's in Tarsus, 
which was Paul's hometown. So at some point in this timeline, Paul had gone home, really, to spend some time at home. And Tarsus and Antioch are very close to one another. And so Barnabas thinks to himself, I'll go get Paul. So he goes over to Tarsus, gets Paul, and tells Paul about everything that was happening in Antioch and saying, I need your help. And so Paul's like, I'm in. So they go to Antioch, and they're teaching and building the church and raising up leaders and, and uh, doing that. And we're told, this is Acts 11, verse 27. It says, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. So we skipped over it a little bit, but at the beginning of chapter 2, you notice that Paul says that he came to Jerusalem because of a revelation. Now, we're not really sure exactly what Paul meant by that or what the revelation was. Um, it's possible that this is what that revelation was. Um, if you just look at the word revelation, it can, at, the, at its very basic understanding, it can simply just mean something that was previously unknown has now been made known, right? And so these men came to Paul and made known to them that Jerusalem was really struggling. That Jerusalem, that there was a famine coming to Jerusalem and they were going to be hit hard. And so what does he do? Verse 29, it says, The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Saul was already in Jerusalem bringing gifts to those that were struggling in Jerusalem. And so Peter and James and John are saying, Paul, remember the poor. If you were Paul, you probably very easily could have said, that's what I've been doing this whole time. Like, that's why I'm here. And so... Paul has this conversation with Peter, but I want you to notice, let me read for you. This is, um, this is 1 Corinthians 16. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. He says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. So we're back to, Gal back to Galatia again, that Paul had been saying to the churches in Corinth, Paul had been saying this message to the church in Galatians as well. Here's what he said. He says, Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Are those collections that were made by those churches, were those collections for Paul? Here's what he says. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men that you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, then they will accompany me, meaning I like Jerusalem too. So if I go down, then they can come with me, right? So he had been telling the churches in Corinth, he had been telling the churches in Galatia, probably as a result of this conversation with Peter, save up money at the first of every month, save up your money so that when I come, I can take those collections and I can take it to Jerusalem so that we can support those that were hurting, we can support those that were struggling He says, interesting enough, it's like he's saying, guys, I want you to budget for ministry. I want you to budget for ministry. First of the month, I want you to set some money aside. Isn't that kind of what he's saying? It's not just about them being poor, but it's about supporting this ministry where Jews from all over the place were coming to faith in Jesus. Budget for ministry. So as we think about how we apply a text like this, I think it's a good question. I think it's a great reminder for us um, in terms of as we think about our own budgets, do our budgets reflect our desire to see other people come to Christ? If some random person were to sit down and look at your budget on paper, what kind of things would they determine are important to you? What kind of conclusions might they come to? It was so much more than just, hey, these people are poor and they need your help. It was about supporting the ministry that these men were having in those people's lives and helping them hear the gospel, helping them come to faith in Christ. But I think maybe even just more generally speaking, I think for Peter to tell Paul, I want you to remember the poor, he's saying, Paul, as you fight for the truth, Paul, I know you love a good theological debate. Like, I know you love, um, you love these, these doctrinal disputes um, 
but I want you to remember that your theology needs to be lived out. As we think about our, our, our own theology, the things that we understand in terms of the nature and the character of God, God's heart for the lost, God's heart for the church, those things are not just little treasured pieces of information that were meant to be lodged away in your brain somewhere, never to leave again. But instead, that knowledge, that understanding of the nature and character of God and his heart for lost people should be lived out. And I think that's what Peter's telling Paul, is as you fight so hard for the gospel, as you fight so hard for truth, remember that your theology, your faith needs to be lived out. You know, I think about opportunities that, that might come our way, maybe opportunities for us to give to the Benevolent Fund, which goes to help those in our church family who are struggling, or um, as Brandon shared this morning, opportunities maybe to serve and to provide meals for, for those in our city that are struggling. I mean, those kinds of ministry opportunities, those things come and go. But I think more generally to understand what it is that Paul understood is that our theology needs feet. And it, it doesn't just come into our brains and just stick there, but it has to be lived out. And so that we as a church, we as individuals can say, these are the things that I was eager to do as well. And we would respond in the same way that, that Paul responded. So let me, let me pray for us. Father, I do want to pray for, for us as a, as a church family. Pray for us as, as individuals God, that we would be people who would stand on that pillar of truth, that we wouldn't give an inch, that we wouldn't take one step away from the message and the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that, our, that you would help us to, that, uh, to give our theology feet. Lord, would you open our eyes to those around us in this world? Would you open our eyes to those around us in our city or those that, that, that we may know individually, God, that are hurting um, and that your truth would be lived out in our lives as we seek to, to minister to, to others. And so pray that you would do that in our lives. I pray that you would do that in us as a church family as well. So we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for coming. It's great to, it's great to have you here. Um, in a second, the ushers are going to come forward and dismiss you. So if you would, just go ahead and stay seated and wait for, for them to do that. But as you're, you're waiting for them, why don't you... Uh, Turn around and, and find somebody around you. Say good morning and, and uh, yeah, welcome them this morning. Have a good week.